Oh, hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining in. My name is Mindy Johnson and you are here at Primary Sources today. We've got a really extraordinary round of live streaming with uh, a, one of our most favorite people on the planet, the remarkable Don Hahn. But to get us into uh, where we're at, where, what we're going to be exploring through the course of all of this, um, I'd like to jump in with a little bit of a, a sense of what we're going to be covering. Um, I know we're in a little bit of a different circumstances these days, but when we gather collectively in a, a theater, uh, there's something really remarkable that happens, um, sort of placed around this, this bright light in a darkened room with uh, total strangers. There's a process that unfolds. And uh, for me, it was always something to be fascinated with how this idea got to the screen with so many stories and and various ideas um, that was always something when you went into a movie theater and still is when you put a great movie on the wonder and excitement and surprise of where this story can take you but for me and the way i think and i think many of you as creatives um, where this take how how we get to this story is the other question that fascinated me in the process what would it take to get this story on the big screen, uh, which was ultimately the end goal? But I was always more fascinated with the behind the scenes, how we got to what we knew and loved within our favorite films. And it really is the process of pre-production, several steps certainly in production, but today we're going to focus on pre-production and the steps necessary to prepare for production um, and all that occurs before production. Now, that's going to vary from discipline to discipline, uh, documentary, live action, animation. It's going to have a different process to it. But for the most part, we need to look at story and the writing of it and what goes into how this idea gets put down. Uh, we'll possibly have storyboards and some, this is the great Saul Bass's sequence from Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Um, Lots of planning, lots of uh, production work going on, chaos in many ways, controlled chaos. We have to possibly look at costume designs, what are they going to be wearing and why, uh, what will characters be, con what will be conveyed through those costume designs, where are we going to shoot this, how is it going to be put together, there are so many questions that unfold. We have to cast our story to find out who might be right for a part. Um, and whether it's human beings or even, yes, animals are cast. Uh, if you're going to produce a version of Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat, you're going to have to hold auditions for the quintessential black cat, believe it or not, in 1961. That was the case. So many steps in the process to getting to that green light, getting to the word go in terms of actual physical production, and how we finally ultimately get that vision through the lens onto the screen. So it's a process. And looking at how we break down this process, a series of actions, uh, preparation, activities involved in hiring and firing, and how we're going to build this beast, um, sort of the, the mixture, the concoction, the alchemy of this is a process indeed. And we start with various pieces, various elements uh, that we need to assemble to put together. We need to then maybe assemble them into some sort of linear order. We may not fully know what the ultimate outcome is going to be, but soon the pieces start coming together, formulating, fitting into proper position, and ultimately we're nearing the end, <laughs> and yet one piece may be missing, and until we get that final image in place, uh, we are ready, and soon that mysterious puzzle has come together, and we are in the theater. So it's a it's a the process of this. Uh, we get to see the end result, but sometimes you need to look at how, what went on behind the scenes, in getting this to its point. And today's guest is one person who understands the alchemy of this in multiple disciplines and areas and forums, 
And uh, it is as a speaker, as a storyteller, as an author, um, some of his books that he has uh, helped to formulate to help our understanding of the production process, the storytelling process, um, our, our own creativity as a fine artist, um, exploring lots of great subject matter here. Um, yes, he even has time to produce documentaries for television. These are just a few of his more recent works and also for the large screen and small screen. Um, many documentaries for the Disney Nature series to uh, exploring how animation got us to where we are today through Waking Sleeping Beauty, Howard, and just remarkable stories uh, of people around us who may not always get the spotlight to live action productions of note and some forthcoming and most renowned of course for his legendary work in animation. So it is my great joy today to welcome uh, one of our most favorite people on the planet, the remarkable Don Hahn. And Hello. with that, <laughs> we're going to bring Don live and get him back on camera here in a moment. And Hello, he Don. Is. Welcome. So, there you are. Hi, <laughs> gotcha. everybody. Thank you. Mindy, I have to say you have the best introductions and slides of anybody on the planet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have yeah. keeps keeps me busy, keeps me creative as well. My my humble yeah, well, to get you into. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah. So um, let's start with this idea of story or ideas with ideas as a as a creative being. Um, where do you get uh, ideas? Oftentimes, uh, for example, Beauty and the Beast. In working on that, that had been a legendary story that had been around for a while. Um, but you've also created films that um, really were sort of spun out of thin air in a lot of ways or came to you. Where, where does a good idea come from and, and what is it about a good idea that sparks something in you? Well, I, I think we're all probably alike in one sense in that we have ideas for movies or projects or paintings or recipes or whatever it is that you do. Um, all the time. And so the, the difficult thing for all of us is to try to find how to pick out the, the good ones. Um, and I, I always think of something that Ed Catmull, the great uh, head of Pixar, uh, used to say, which is um, there, there's two points of view on that. One is uh, it's not so much about the story, it's about the team of people you put together to tell that story. And the other point of view is it's all about the story and any team can put that story together. Um, and, and he always said George Lucas uh, subscribed to that kind of point of view, which is you come up with a great idea and anybody can do it. But I re actually agree with Ed Catmull. I feel like, uh, think about a movie like Ratatouille. That's the worst idea for a movie ever. Let's put rats in a kitchen and, and say they'd like to cook. That I, Like nobody would ever greenlight that movie. Uh, Up is the same way. Let's put a Boy Scout with an 80 year old man in a balloon. That's probably illegal in many places. And it's just the wrong, uh, it's like a bad idea. But you put some really clever story people on it and you end up with a um, truly amazing movie. Ratatouille is one of my favorite Pixar movies. So I really subscribe to that. And so um, as a producer, maybe I, I subscribe to it even more because it's all about the building the team of people that are going to execute that story. So my problem as a, as a director or a writer is I, I have a lot every day I have ideas for movies and documentaries and things. And I use a uh, kind of 48 hour test, which is I could get really excited about anything, uh, but I kind of hold on and wait for a couple of days to see if I've, I'm just as excited about something. And that excitement fades a lot. And so you look for something that is, um, has energy to it, because really what you're doing on, in filmmaking is you're bringing some form of energy to the audience and, um, and that energy comes from you. And, so the other thing is the idea needs to be personal to you. Otherwise, it's just a job. So if you look at uh, Up that we were just talking about, that was personal to Pete Docter because it was uh, inspired in, in some small part by Joe Grant. Pete and Joe were really close to each other. Pete loved Joe, who was you know several years his senior, and wanted to tell a movie 
uh, about what it was like to be older and to lose a spouse and all those things that happen when you're older that nobody tells you about because most movies uh, are about young, beautiful people. Um, so it's a very personal story for him. And, and it's one thing I admire about Disney and Pixar is the directors and producers that make these films have a personal investment in them. So when you're looking for your projects, it's, it's really about that. Is there a story in your life you can tell or something personal? Um, when it comes to something like Beauty and the Beast, you have to find it. You know, it was, that was an assignment that was given to, uh, given to me. And so you have to go, well, how can I relate to this? And I, and that is a, a long lasting story because you, everybody can relate to it. Everybody can relate to a, um, a an ugly, hairy uh, guy who needs to be tamed. At least as a man, I can relate to that. Um, and, and I think that's something that we could get into and understand. Um, and then that gets you more excited. And then as, um, as I could build a team around that movie, um, then they bring their own energy to it. And uh, the team on that movie was uh, extraordinary. Looking back, almost everyone on the story department in that movie uh, is now or has been a director. So we have, uh, our story team was uh, Roger Allers, who did Lion King, was the head of story, and Chris Sanders and Brenda Chapman and Kelly Asbury, and all those people were on our story team. Um, so that energy builds. Uh, so I, I, I really just look for something that has some energy to it uh, that is attractive um, to creative types. So when you get that story, um, as a creative producer, once you've got something, a property or an idea or an assignment, um, obviously you've got to start building teams. Um, you've got to flush this out. Is it in, in making choices of if, what medium we're going to move in forward in? Is this going to be a documentary? Is this going to be animated? Is this going to be live action television? Where am I taking this story? Talk a little bit about that step in the process of, um, clearly that's usually defined when you start. This is, you know, we're making a documentary for television or uh, giving thought to where this is going to be seen. Now we've got the internet and a million other places that this can be conveyed in, but yeah. How would you begin formulating that team? You mentioned other story artists and uh, writers. Um, talk a bit about that process for you. Well, I, I think you want to look for chemistry. You want to stay as small as you can, as long as you can. Um, that's not a problem for most of us because on, listen, on documentary projects I work on, I have at the most four people working on them. So I'll have an editor, a producer, and a researcher. Um, so I try to stay small, even on the big features that might end up with 600 people on them. Um, and, and it's mainly because the more people you add, uh, the more difficult communication is, and the more the sharp edges get knocked off the story. Um, there's something about a larger group of people that can, it doesn't always happen, but can uh, kind of bland things out. And uh, we all go back to comfort level. So we you know, we, we have a comfortable way to draw, a comfortable way to write songs. And, and, and if we're too kind of large and uh, in our production, it's too easy to go back to those very comfortable things that we've been doing all our lives. So you try to stay small and challenge each other. And then it really is a lot of chemistry. And um, there, inevitably, um, you try to create events or moments early in the project where you can find out if that chemistry is working. So let's go to back to Beauty and the Beast or... Um, uh, only because it's an example you brought up. We went to France with a small team of people for a research trip. Uh, they've done the same on a, really every movie, you know, on, on uh, Frozen, they went to the uh, Scandinavian countries. And it's a bonding opportunity for the directors, the art director, and a, a small group of key talent to get along and learn about each other. And the, um, uh, Rob Minkoff, who did... Uh, Lion King with me had a great way of saying it. He said, you really want to choose uh, five or six people that you would love to have dinner with and sit around a table and just talk about life and talk about, you know, your family and what you're doing and what your aspirations are. And that was one of his criteria for picking that team. And I, I think that's actually more true than we'd like to think. Yes, you want skilled people and you want people that are the best at what they do. Uh, but if you can't work with them, that doesn't really help. So I really look for those, um, you know, on, on beauty, it was, uh, you know, Lisa Keen and 
um, Ed Gertner and some really talented people. Uh, but we also got along and, and we got along so much that we wanted to work together again. And so I tried to keep uh, that team together on Hunchback of Notre Dame and other shows. Um, there's, there's often casualties, you know, people fall out, people come and go and that's okay. You're, it's tough as a producer to tell someone they're not working out, but inevitably you're doing them a favor because to have someone suffer through a movie for a couple of years of their life with the bad chemistry, it's like suffering through a bad relationship or a bad marriage. Um, it, it's not fair to the group. It's not fair to that individual. And in, in really every case I've seen, that person, once they're released from the movie, go on to find a movie where they are good, where they do have great chemistry. And um, so we all have, you know, we all have a, a way of fitting in or not. And, um, you know, and so sometimes when it doesn't work, you're, you just let it happen. Um, and then that happens. And usually in the early days of production, usually you find out pretty early on that somebody's style doesn't work or their method of communicating is assaultive or whatever the problem is. And uh, you move on. So um, <laughs> I've always lauded you for your great people skills and talked a little bit about that. What do you do um, if you're making those choices? Is, are you looking for sensibilities? Uh, are you looking at the past work of people? Are you looking at, uh, as you're building your team here, are you thinking, you know, they've, they've written, uh, they're sort of known for their comedy, but this has got a little bit more of a serious element, you know, I better try someone else, or, or maybe they have the right mix, or give them that opportunity. What, what's the process for you in making those choices? Um, it's, it is a casting process. I, Story? I, I, well, yeah. I look at, uh, yeah, I look at Walt Disney a lot because he, I think his main strength was not as an artist, but as a uh, team builder and recognizing talent in people. And his other strength was uh, taking a risk on people. So he would bring in, I think of Ruth Shellhorn, who did the, uh, we, you and I have talked about before, who did the landscape architecture on Disneyland. He didn't know who Ruth Shellhorn was. She was a woman in the 50s. But she was incredibly gifted, um, and and Walt brought her in and said, "Hey, can you lay out Disneyland uh, traffic circulation for us, and sidewalks, and that kind of thing?" Um, so he would take a risk on people, and I think that is another uh, thing you look for, you know. And I, uh, on Lion King, for example, I couldn't get anybody to work on it. Everybody was moving to Pocahontas. That's where Alan Menken was. That's where Glenn Keane was. And Pocahontas is a great movie, but. Nobody wanted to work on the little movie about a lion cub who gets framed for murder with music by Elton John. So I would um, take people out to lunch. I would take them to dinner. I'd go dancing with them. And we ended up with a crew that was very, what you could argue was very inexperienced. A few exceptions. There were people like, um, oh, James Baxter uh, and uh, Andrea Stasia. But in large part, like, uh, you know, <coughs> the team that did Puma and Timon, it was very, <clears throat> let me sip on my tea. Yeah, <laughs> medicinal. <laughs> the team that did Pum and Timon was just brand new. <clears throat> so they were, um, you know, hungry to make a contribution. And that's what I look for, is that person who has a hunger to make a contribution. So is somebody, you know, if they're able to, are you looking at portfolios? Is it their enthusiasm? Um, and giving that opportunity to someone who's uh, ready for the next step. What do you, what do you see in someone who's ready for the next step? Is is that? Um, you, you, you just want to look for <clears throat> that desire, that person who wants. Uh, sorry, I have morning voice. <clears throat> that person that wants the opportunity, and we all want that opportunity. Uh, many people would say. Uh, you know, gee, Don, I want to be a supervisor. I want to be this or that. But also that it has the skills and also the match because the directors who are the primary storytellers have to feel a, uh, a good casting fit. So sometimes it'll be like, you can go to Dave Cruxma comes to mind uh, for a charming Mrs. Potts kind of character um, any day of the week. He's funny, he's appealing, he draws incredibly well. And that kind of person is reliable, a known commodity or whatever. If it's a new person, you're looking for somebody that um, 
has a fresh point of view. You don't want a rubber stamp of somebody else that you have on your crew and someone that will bring some energy to the project and someone that will uh, knock themselves out to have that opportunity. And they do, you know, I, I, this is ancient history, but on Roger Rabbit, I brought in um, a lot of new people, uh, people I had never worked with before because we did it in London. I brought four, uh, four people over from the studio, uh, Andreas Deja, Phil Niblink, some others. And then we hired people. I hired James Baxter out of art school. James Baxter, who I think is a genius. And we knew, by the way, he was a genius when we hired him out of art school. You know, so <laughs> it, it, he just was really naturally gifted. Um, uh, Nick Ranieri came out of that. I, Tom Cito, who I've never worked with before, I hired on that movie. Um, so a lot of those people come out of the woodwork uh, when, when duty calls and you're desperate and you need to hire people. So you know, for example, on your budget and schedule, you need to eventually get up to 20 animators and you only know of 10, uh, you're gonna go out and hang, hang a shingle out. And that's what we've done. That's what Walt Disney did um, back in the 30s when he was staffing up. You advertise and you have people come in and you see a lot of people and you don't necessarily hire a lot of people, uh, but that's where you find those little uh, people you're willing to take a risk on. And, and that excites me. I love work with um, new talent. And, and by that, I mean not young talent, although I love that too, but I just mean new talent. Uh, it might be someone who is uh, you know, deep in their career that I've never worked with before, but they're amazing. And, and a lot of times, I, last year for one of my documentaries, I hired a, a, literally a graduate from uh, Art Center. She just graduated as an illustration major. And um, I brought her in as a researcher and a PA on my show, on my movie. Uh, she worked on the Howard Ashman documentary. And uh, now she's working at Nickelodeon. And, uh, and I love that. You know, I love bringing somebody in for a year, working with them, um, seeing what they can do, encouraging them and then letting them loose because I think that's, um, that's actually part of my job. So in your job and looking at this new talent, we have a number of folks who are at that point in school looking to get their portfolios out there to get their work out. What kinds of things are you, what sparks you? What, what are you looking for? What shows that there's brilliance on the page? Um, you know what I really like is uh, a is progress and the relationship with somebody. We, I'm just speaking the truth here. You, no one ever hires someone they don't really know or they don't have a uh, good reference for. I, um, I hire people generally who I have heard are amazing or are really interesting, so I sought out them. Or if they've come to me with a portfolio, I might hire them on the third or fourth submission of that portfolio. And that's always been the case. You know, I, I again, ancient history, but I ran the pr training program at Disney back in the 80s uh, when the uh, older guys were retiring and we brought in a lot of new people. We would see a portfolio from Gary Trousdale, who directed Beauty and the Beast. Gary's portfolio wasn't great. Uh, and so we said, thanks, Gary, keep in touch. Gary went away for six months, went back to CalArts. Gary came back with his portfolio. We said, oh, Gary, this is such an improvement. It's fantastic. We don't really have any spots for you, but we love you. Go back to school. So Gary would go back to school. Six months later, Gary would come into this portfolio. We'd go, you know, we're desperate for people. We need, can you work in special effects? Uh, and Gary said, sure. Gary came in and ended up being a great effects animator and a great story person and a great director. You know, so that's kind of a, 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 the typical way that someone might trip into it. As a producer, you really have uh, seasons of hiring and seasons where you're not doing anything. I have a lot of people right now who will send me an email saying, um, I'd really like to, to work with you or work on a project you're doing, but I, I, I mean, right now, I don't have anything that is available. Um, last year, it was much busier and I could maybe say, well, what do you do and have a dialogue? Anyway, getting back to my original statement, it, you really hire people that you know. And by know, I mean that you've had a few communications with. So if you're looking to work, um, name a studio, upload your portfolio, make sure you talk to the recruiter, make sure they know your name. Um, a lot of us are introverted, so that's hard for us. But don't let that stop you. Uh, just a simple conversation via email or a simple FaceTime to say, um, I, you know, I love your studio. I'd like to have the opportunity to work there. Here's my portfolio. 
Don't be shocked if they say, no, they don't have anything. But on the second or third or fourth time, they might say, oh my God, we're staffing up for the show. And I remember you from six months ago, are you available? That's exactly how it happens. So that repeated kind of contact is what I like. And uh, most studios have terrific recruiters. I mean, you go around to, if, if you want to work at anywhere, DreamWorks, Disney, Pixar, um, know their names, know who they are, keep your portfolio current. A portfolio is a living, breathing thing. Uh, it's not, you know, you take out your student work, put in your more recent work. If you don't have more recent work, do some. Um, and make sure your portfolio is up to date. And then keep that repeated contact with people because that's um, how you'll get hired. And also stay flexible. I, I uh, it, it, talked to somebody once. I went back to Savannah College of Art and Design and did a program review for them once. And I talked to one of their students and, and I said, what do you want to do? And he said, I really want to be a modeler at Pixar. And, and I said, oh, that's really great. What else do you want to do? And that's all. That's my dream. I want to be a modeler at Pixar. And I thought, and I told him this, I said, you know, if that doesn't happen, you need to have uh, some other uh, branches of your vision for what you would like to do. Because a lot of times that little company that does commercials or that little company that does stop motion or whatever is going to be the perfect place for you. So uh, along with your dream job, also get out there and see if there's places that, uh, let's say you want to be a character designer or a story artist, Go call the studio that has, uh, you know, five or ten people and, and, and look for people like Ken Duncan or, or Creative Capers or there's hundreds of them and uh, keep in touch with them. And, and so and being a story artist there, you're going to get more personal attention. You're going to have more variety of what you work on. Um, and, and working at a large studio is spectacular, but the smaller company sometimes might be the way to go. So get your portfolio out there to a variety of companies. And just because you want to be a modeler of Pixar, don't uh, you know? Don't turn down that interesting job uh, for six months doing a, a commercial. Yeah, and, and that flexibility. I think um, I've talked quite a bit with my students about being prepared to pivot, and you never know what direction that'll take you in, where where it may yeah. take you. And I like your point about um, the need for uh, you know growing in your career and in your creativity. And I think as a producer, I know you've seen, you've fostered a lot of people's growth. Uh, just as you were saying, Walt Disney did that recognized often, more often than not, what someone could do before the person themselves recognized it. So right. that's a, a large part of what makes you the, the trusted producer that you are. That's <laughs> a great skill. Thank you. Like back to those amazing people skills. Um, now, and, and I, use the term per trusted purposefully because you've been entrusted with some of the the companies you know in fostering some of the greatest stories coming out of the company in a long time and beyond outside of disney in your own individual storytelling um when you're let's go back to story a little bit when, when you're working with writers um Talk a little bit about that process. I know you've spoken quite a bit about artists and, and as actors with pencils, that's an important role, but working with writers and getting story developed, whether they're story artists or actual you know, script writers on live action and animation, yes, there are scripts involved. Um, we'll talk a bit about that process, how you approach it, whether you, uh, how involved you are with it, the twists and turns of story, what uh, you know, how it can change from initially the concept and idea to getting to physical production. Talk about that evolution. Um, what a great question. Um, so let's, uh, let's dive in. It, writers are crucial. There was a time when animation writers were in-house and not as crucial. Um, in Walt Disney's era, they were very crucial he would often pair a writer with a story sketch artist and the writer would create the creative content and the sketch artist would just draw what the writer told him or her to draw. And uh, that changed over the years. And by the 1970s and 80s, uh, particularly 1984, um, Jeffrey Katzenberg, Michael Eisner, those guys came into Disney Studios and were used to live action. And every, uh, every film had to start with the script. And there were a lot of people, myself included, just said a script, what's a script? Um, but so often writers were viewed with suspicion. 
now from my uh, elderly vantage point, I really feel like uh, it, it, what a great, cheap, interesting way to start a movie is with a writer. Go figure. Um, and it, you, it, it doesn't need to be a threat. You don't need to feel like the writer's going to steal all your ideas or whatever. The writer's going to bring some order and some uh, structure to a movie. The writer's going to be uh, really good at character development. Uh, and then what you need to do as a director or a, a producer is to edit. Um, so a lot of times when we started Atlantis, for example, Tab Murphy, wrote, who wrote Tarzan, he wrote Gorillas in the Mist. He's a great writer. And his script was probably 250 pages long. It was this huge script. And animation scripts are, should be 80 or 90 pages. Um, but it was full of ideas that were fantastic, you know, monster battles and conversations around a campfire and all that stuff. So you go through and then you have this buffet of ideas that the writers created for you and you can pick and choose um, and, and try those things. Uh, the same is true of, let's say, Linda Wolverton. I, I've worked with her a lot. And Linda's, um, Linda can be difficult. She's very opinionated. She's very strong in her point of view. But I really admire that about her and like that about her because she comes into the room uh, not necessarily trying to please everybody, but comes in with a point of view. And that's what you want. That's why you hire somebody like that. So she on Maleficent, for example, um, I remember we sat in a room with a development executive, Linda uh, and myself. It was like three or four people. And we were talking about the resolution of that movie in Love's True Kiss. And the idea that in the fairy tale, Love's True Kiss had to come from a prince. So here we're going to tell a story about a beautiful young princess, Aurora, who's the protagonist of the movie and sleeps through the entire movie until her man shows up and then she can have her life. Well, that's a horrible story. I didn't want to tell that. Uh, it was fine perhaps in the 1950s, but not so good today. So we said, well, can we change it? And Linda said, well, yeah, of course we can. And then the more we talked about it, uh, she started coming up with the idea, well, what the movie's called Maleficent. What if Love's True Kiss comes from Maleficent? And then everybody went, no, that can't be. And that's what we ended up with. So she was able to uh, think out of the box, which Walt Disney did all the time, and come to the table with something that was totally ridiculous and just say, well, Maleficent, this witch of a character, is going to be the one that sees the innocence in Aurora and look past the princes, these vapid characters, <laughs> into what love means. Well, that was really profound, and that really made that movie, that one decision. Mm -hmm. So um, you want somebody to hit you upside the head. Uh, we use many writers sometimes. Writers don't often make it through the whole movie. So on some movies, we'll um, bring in writers. Uh, this happens in the documentaries a lot. We'll start out writing with one writer, and then um, like on Waking Sleeping Beauty, um, we had uh, two different writers, and we had three different editors. And so, uh, and, and it's not that anybody did a bad job, but we started out with Vartan, Vartan assembled the movie. And then uh, JD came in and JD, he did a cut of the movie, it was a lot better. And uh, we did the same thing on um, the Tyrus Wong documentary. We had multiple editors. They do the same thing at Pixar. So, you, so at, like with a script, uh, a story reel um, can have multiple viewpoints. And you do that because we lose our freshness. We lose our ability to see. Um, so we had three editors on some of those projects. Uh, because a new person comes in and says, what are you lingering so long on this scene for? It doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, why are you sitting here talking around the campfire about what you're eating for lunch? This is a movie about exploring Atlantis. You know, so that kind of editing is brilliant and it's about the fresh eyes. Um, Pixar does that all the time. Man, the Pixar guys and, and the Disney guys as well were great about bringing fresh people in and uh, and in a way, that's what Walt Disney did. He was the fresh eyes because he wasn't there every day, but he could come in and say, yeah, that works. That doesn't work. What were you thinking? Or, oh my God, that's fantastic. I would have never thought of that. So those fresh eyes, it, it, there's an element of trust. You have to trust that person. Um, but you have to test your ideas. And this, by the way, uh, applies to painting. It applies to your portfolio. So show your portfolio to people you trust and have them be honest with you and say things like, oh boy, that, you know, piece number five is not your best piece. Or uh, why are you including all these chicken recipes in your drawing portfolio? They don't belong there. And, you know, to come up with things that are uh, constructive fresh eyes for your projects, whatever they are, no matter how small they are, whether it's a script, whether it's some 
story sketches, whether it's a portfolio, whether it's a feature length film, uh, is to get those fresh eyes on your project. And that's, that's a secret weapon. It's why animated films are better than live action films in terms of their content, because they're iterative. You can iterate and repeat on an animated movie all the way up to opening day, and we do uh, the same on documentaries and make changes um, because you show it and you can, you can see what's wrong and far better that you make the change than you wait for the movie to be released and let the audience make the change or the critics make the change. Good point. Now, a few questions on that. Um, was Linda your first choice on Maleficent? Uh, yes. <laughs> she was. She, I, you know, I, <clears throat> I can't remember reasons. anything else. I mean, she's... Well, I, I, yeah, and we, that movie came together uh, the following way. I, I pitched two ideas to Tim Burton at the same time. One was Frankenweenie and one was Maleficent. I pitched uh, uh, Frankenweenie by showing some drawings that Mike Gabriel did. I said, this is your movie, but it was a short when you made it, it was live action. What if we remake it in a longer, more fleshed out version as a stop motion movie? Um, and so I was, you know, talk about getting people excited about your ideas. Tim loved that idea. It was his idea. He, he only did a half hour version and felt like he could expand it. So that worked. And then for Maleficent, I, I, I took a Mark Davis drawing with me to London. And when I saw Tim, I held it up and I said, um, uh, Walt Disney's Maleficent. And he grabbed the drawing out of my hand and put it on his wall. So that was all it took on that project. In the end, he couldn't direct it. He was busy with other projects and things. But when Tim was on the project, that's when I brought Linda in. I ran into Linda at uh, Comic-Con in San Diego. And um, I said, Linda, I need you on a project. And now Linda had worked with Tim on Alice in Wonderland. And she did the same thing on that project. She took a story that uh, didn't work completely when Walt Disney released his version in the 50s. It was scattered. It was... Um, delightful, but not completely uh, um, held together as a story. <clears throat> and Linda took that and just said, well, what if we make this about someone who's uh, kind of escaping from an arranged marriage? And she gets down the rabbit hole and goes through all these visions or experiences because she's scared to death of the uh, commitment she's made to get married to a man she wasn't sure she'd love. That's a big idea. And that puts a uh, an overlay on Alice in Wonderland that none of us would have thought about, um, just like Maleficent. So Tim had worked with her, uh, Linda knew him, uh, and it was a beautiful marriage. When Tim fell out, Linda stayed with the project and kept going all the way through, and uh, Angelia Jolie came on that project, and she liked Linda, and so that, that worked really well. Um, so that's what you look for. You look for those people who are interesting and opinionated and will bring some challenging thoughts to the table what you don't look for is your friend that you went to high school with that uh, loves everything you do. And we all have those people in our life and, and thank God for them. But the, the, you're working with writers like that and just saying, oh man, Don, this is such a great idea. Uh, I'll just go home and write up your ideas. I, that's not as interesting to me. Uh, I'd much rather say, hey, I have this idea. Here's, here's a couple of pages of what I think. What do you think? And then have somebody come back and say, well, I think this is half of a good idea and I don't like this and, you know, feed, and challenge you. Mm -hmm. um, well, a couple of things, and this is what's great about getting to speak with you is you always, um, we can go off on a million tangents, but um, <laughs> it, when you, you bring up great points about being, I call it, I tend to call it uh, being too close to the canvas. You're, you're a little myopic in, in your view of the story and by bringing in the fresh eyes, the fresh views, the, the critical thinkers who will help point out some of our own myopic <laughs> issues that helps to expand. Um, how do you, let's talk a little bit about communication. You, you brought up some great examples of pitching, uh, getting those ideas presented to your key people. What other things have you done or do you suggest to get people on board with your vision or to, uh, or the project to bring their vision to your project? Well, um, the movie business is a momentum business. And by that, I mean um, momentum pretty much drives everything. And if you can sustain that momentum and have it increase, uh, that tends to 
have a certain energy to it. If you lose that momentum or if your momentum, momentum ever, never gets started, uh, it's harder. So our problem on a lot of movies is uh, it, people maybe didn't understand it or the energy was on another project. People felt like they wanted to migrate somewhere else um, and there just wasn't an energy on it. And we've talked a lot about energy today, but I think it's, it's the right way to say it. <coughs> it's that momentum that draws people to the project. Um, with Lion King, Andreas Deja was crazy about that project because it was four-legged animals and he loved Jungle Book. Um, so everybody has their own reason for coming to it. And that momentum can be created by anything. When people started listening to um, uh, Hans Zimmer's um, versions of the songs and the score, it was really exciting. When people heard the first songs that Alan Menken and Howard Ashman wrote for Little Mermaid, it was like throwing a match into a gasoline tank. People got so up about the possibilities of that show. The reverse can happen. You can have some great energy around an idea and that energy drains and then it becomes a death march. Um, and I've worked on a few of those movies which should remain nameless. Um, but there's, for, for whatever reason, the chemistry doesn't work, the energy drains out of a project and you start to lose momentum. And that's the hardest part of being a producer or a director or anybody on a movie is how do you rekindle that? How, you know, you're deep in production, you're in the middle of the production, the momentum's gone, maybe you had a bad screening, maybe an executive didn't like what you're doing, uh, maybe you're over budget and you have budget cutbacks, all of which have happened on pretty much all of my projects, um, but you find ways to keep going. Sometimes it's as simple as, uh, you know, having a party on a Friday night with margaritas. Sometimes it's taking individuals out to lunch and talking to them, individuals that maybe are uh, not contributing any energy to the project. Um, because nobody works on movies for money. And, and I, I will argue this um, the rest of my life. We work on movies because we're passionate about what we do and we're passionate about the story idea and we believe in it. Um, yes, some movies are a job more than others but we come to work in the morning because we get excited about what we do. Yes, we need to pay our bills, but we are excited about what we do and that's why we come to work. So you have to create some sort of genuine, authentic excitement. I, I have, I, I'm guilty of sometimes doing like, well, let's manufacture some excitement, you know? Let's bring in a mariachi band um, and, and try to do things that create the illusion of excitement. But the excitement always comes from the movie and it always comes from the story. It doesn't come from, hey, we just built a gym downstairs, uh, or hey, free lunches this Saturday, because those are all necessary and lovely, but it comes always from the movie, and that always comes from the story and the leadership of the team of people that's making it. So that's, that's the secret weapon, is um, we come to work because we love making movies, and we love what we do, and so that story and that movie and that team has to be shared, you have to create a feeling like people can contribute. You, I, we solicit notes from the crew all the time. Some of the best notes we've gotten on movies are from the coffee guy um, or, or, you know, or the worst notes from the lead animator. You know, you never know. Um, so you solicit those notes. People understand that their notes aren't going to always be taken, but they feel listened to. They feel involved um, as opposed to say, you know, just shut up and do your job. Close your door. If I need you, I'll, 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 I'll let you know. That's horrible. I think, you know, you really want to have that feeling like, hey, I can contribute to this. And most people understand that. We understand, yes, we're going to contribute to a, a, a portion of the movie because we're a modeler or we're a storyboard artist or whatever. Um, but they also understand that, um, you know, that's their job, but they can contribute on a larger scale. Um, and also looking for that energy from any source. I mentioned Hans Zimmer, but musicians, um, and uh, visual development artists can create so much energy. When we brought Mike Mignola in on Atlantis, for example, um, his artwork created so much energy on that project. Um, uh, uh, Gerald Scarf came in on Hercules and created tremendous energy. Getting an outside uh, talent in to contribute to it is a fantastic way to develop that energy as well. Um, so if you're starting out on a project uh, and you're having trouble getting off the ground, you have a group of three or four people making something, um, you know, bring in somebody that can energize you. If you can't afford that, 
uh, go out and watch a, watch a movie together, get together and watch a great film or a great documentary and let that, that Hitchcock film or that Ken Burns movie uh, energize you and get you talking again. Um, so sometimes that outside uh, grenade you can throw into your project is wonderful. Al Hirschfeld came into Aladdin in that same way um, and energized everybody. So that becomes really important. Um, and I've done that on documentaries too. I, uh, I do the same thing on documentaries. There's no difference. Bring in outside people. Um, sometimes that's a great cinematographer. Uh, sometimes another editor. Um, and just somebody that'll give you a fresh point of view. Sometimes, like on, we did a movie called Chimpanzee for Disney Nature. Our outside person was Jane Goodall. It was like working with Mother Teresa. You know, here's a woman who's dedicated her life to preserving nature and, and primates and studying and chimpanzees. And she's uh, interesting and academic and uh, loving and lovable and articulate. And, and you, you just pay attention when she's in the room. Um, and, and that was our, that set the bar pretty damn high on that movie. Uh, and that's what you want. You want somebody to come in and set the bar. I, th I think of uh, Glenn Keane and Kobe Bryant who won an uh, Oscar for their basketball movie. Um, I think Kobe uh, made Glenn sit up and take notice and he had to please somebody else. And I think vice versa. I think Glenn made Kobe sit up and just say, hey, if I want to do this, I have to play with the best. Here's, here's Glenn Keane. And oh, by the way, here's John Williams. Those guys are going to make me sit up and pay attention. So trying to find someone like that, it doesn't have to be a celebrity, but someone like that that gives your project some um, energy and validity and, and a, just a slap in the face um, to make you sit up and pay attention is really important. All of that great uh, morale building and, and energy building and trying to keep all of these as you're moving through pre-production, you've got a lot on your plate. You're a lot that you're juggling as a producer. How do you keep both the, the overarching view of this as well as maintain focus on your primary objective on, you know, getting the elements right in story, getting the casting right, but yet still keeping a sense of the larger picture. Well, I, I think some of it is my personality type. And uh, I know some of you that are listening out there because I can see your um, questions are want to be producers. And I think that's great. And I'm a little bit attention deficit and I'm a really curious person. I was a music major. I love music as, as do you. Um, I am a painter and, and I, I love a lot of variety of things. It's not that I'm good at any one in particular, but um, Take like somebody like David Foster, the great uh, music producer. He grew up uh, playing in Canada, playing every instrument in the orchestra when he was a young kid. And so by the time he got to arranging things for Celine Dion or Michael Buble, he knew what it was like to try to blow air through a, a trombone or deal with the fingerings on a, on a flute. And that kind of experience, and I was lucky enough to have those experiences too. I painted cells, I inked. I did in-betweens, I shot camera, and I sought those things out because I thought it was cool. You know, the, one of the first things I was able to do, like on Fox and the Hound, they were shooting a multiplane shot, and I said, can I come over and help you? You know, and I would just go over and like help get coffee and clean cells and do whatever I could um, to have that experience. So I think that curiosity and that willingness to try out anything. I also look, you may think that I'm crazy and you can hang up on me, but I look at producing as a service job. It's not a boss's job. I think that's a very 1950s kind of approach to it. Uh, but I look at producing or, and I, I look actually at public service in the same way, uh, is that we're here to help the artists make their best movie. We're here to help the director tell a story. And so if you can put that in your mind and say, well, you know, sometimes it's simple things. Like one time Glenn Keane was running out of the pencils that he loves to use. It's like a grease pencil thing. And we didn't have them. And I called the manufacturer and they didn't have them. And they ran off some more and sent them to us. So sometimes it's that attention to detail where someone knows that you're paying attention to them and you can serve them in some little way um, is a gesture from a producer um, that is important. And I don't see that as being soft. I don't see that as being um, 
because there's another school of thought that the more you yell and throw your cell phone, the better the movie will be. The more there's contention on the movie and disagreement, the better it'll be. I'm all for disagreement. I really am. But I'm also all for playing well together. Um, I've never seen uh, a, a strong result out of just simple anger and, um, you know, the, the throwing your cell phone kind of thing. Uh, it creates anxiety where it's not needed. So I love, I love dissent. I love dissenting points of view. I love uh, rig, you know, conversation. I love voices raised about the movie, but about the movie, not about us personally or anything else. You check your ego at the door and then go in and work on the movie as a, as a group. So uh, if you can look at producing from that point of view, that you're more of a service uh, to try to get those people to do their best work. Sometimes that means saying, you know, you're not doing your best work and we have to take you off the movie. Or sometimes it's a battlefield promotion and saying, listen, I know you're just a rank and file background painter, but we need you to be the art director now. So you're, you're constantly uh, moving people around to do their best work. And, and this, this is exactly from Walt Disney. They did the same thing. Now you, you refer to yourself as a creative producer, and yet you've encompassed and experienced in a number of different roles. Um, talk a little bit about, do you work with a, a strong line producer? And uh, does that change up from project to project? How do you staff up your own immediate needs based on different projects? Yeah, I, that's a really good question too, because I'm not, uh, I can do the line and producing part of it. And for many years, I like on Black Cauldron and some of those movies, I was the production manager and more of a, uh, a detailed production person. Uh, but I'm, I didn't care for it that much and I wasn't that good at it. I didn't have the attention to detail uh, that you really need in those jobs. And it frustrated me. And so on, um, like on Beauty and the Beast, Sarah MacArthur, brilliant Sarah MacArthur, was associate producer. And on every movie, every movie, uh, I've had somebody like that. Most recently, I worked with Lori Corngable, who produced a Howard documentary that's going to be um, coming out soon on Disney+. Plus. Uh, and she has that attention to detail that I don't have. So she can keep me in the loop, and I know everything that's going on. But she will go say, uh, you know, we need to license these three movies from the New York Public Library uh, for this amount. And I contacted the photographer. And I, like she has this amazing detail mind. I don't. Uh, and, and it's not that I have to be at 30,000 feet all the time. I just am not good at that. She's really good at that. So I, I need people like that to help me. <laughs> you know, um, I... I, I, at times I've had really good assistants that do a lot of that work. I, uh, when I was at Disney, I had great assistants all the time, Patty Conklin in particular, who really helped with people skills and, and uh, making sure that I knew the problems that were going on on the floor, making sure her ear was to the rail of what was going on. I don't have this as much now because I work with four people or five people. But if I were ever to go into a larger project, you really need that people person to represent you in your office. So a, a miniature team around you is uh, essential too. And, and um, that includes a good finance person. I've had you know, people like Tim Engel, um, who's brilliant. I, a long list of really good finance people, both at Disney. I worked at a film at Paramount, had some great people there, Bob Bacon, um, who understood the finance and business world. I understand it. I like it. I'm curious and interested in finance and business, um, but I don't want to do it for a living. You know, so I'll, I'll, I'll do a budget, I'll look at a budget, I'll manage a budget, I'll manage a schedule. I love to bring my movies in on schedule and budget. Um, it just feels good. I don't like the, uh, you know, drifting over, over budget thing. Um, but there's other people that can help with that and can strategize that and deal with the details of that. But again, I'm not good at. So um, I, you have to just uh, do some soul searching uh, I talked to someone the other day who wanted to build an animation company. And this person felt like it was a perfect time to do it. There's a lot of need for animation. Animation can go ahead during the pandemic. Um, and uh, he was looking to pull together a team of people um, that I questioned. He had uh, people from banking. Let's just put it that way. And I, I really said to him, like, how are these people going to help you on a daily basis? They may get you a loan. And that's fantastic. You need those people. But who's going to help you on a daily basis um, do things that you're not very good at? 
and uh, who's going to be welded to you, no matter how small your project is. Uh, for some of us, you know, if, if we're a student, it used to be my mom helped me on projects like that. And she would help me with, uh, you know, how to pull things together. A classmate, uh, somebody from school, somebody from work. So those teams of people uh, are really important. And it's important to know what you're not good at. You know, I, I animated for a while. I think I would have been an okay animator had I stuck at it, but just okay. I wouldn't have been Glenn Keen um, and I was too impatient. And so being able to get out and work with people and be the producer side of it was a better fit for me. So it's really, um, we're all born to do something on the planet and the hardest damn thing is to try to figure out what that is. If only God would give you like a fortune cookie when you were born and you could open it up and say, hey, I'm gonna play the trombone. That would be easy, but you just don't know. And the other damnedest thing is the river changes. You know, life is like whitewater rafting. So you start out, like a lot of you listening want to be a story person or a director or an animator or whatever. I promise you five years from now, you'll want to do something completely different. And that's a positive. That's good. It's great to uh, you know, let the river take you along and allow you to make those changes in your life because we change different. I'm not the same person I was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Thank God. Um, so you have to listen to yourself and assess yourself um, all the time and allow yourself to grow. And those are all, you know, you knew Joe Grant. I knew Joe Grant, uh, a great, brilliant story guy at Disney who was one of Walt Disney's confidants who he wrote uh, Dumbo and he wrote Lady and the Tramp. Um, he, was, he was 95 and was saying all the same things I'm saying right now. You have to reinvent yourself constantly because uh, if you don't, nobody else will. And if you don't, you'll become stale and you'll become stagnant and nobody wants that. So inspiration for you um, I know you call on a lot of um, the people you worked with and through your experiences. What keeps you inspired today? <laughs> Strong coffee. Um, I, wow, what a great question. I, uh, I don't necessarily get inspired by a lot of one thing. I never grew up with movies. Um, I think by the age of 18, I had maybe seen in a in a movie theater five movies uh maybe a couple in a drive-in with my family when i was younger um I, I watch a lot of movies now but i that's not my primary source i love going to museums when you can uh and you go like on the google art project and stuff and you have every piece of artwork in the world and lately i've been using the um uh, augmented reality feature on my phone and like the other day, I, I downloaded the Caves of Lascaux in southern France. And I held up my iPhone in my living room. And I have a little, like, you know, sensor. And suddenly, I'm, I brought my wife over. I said, hey, look, honey, here's the Caves of Lascaux, full size, in my living room, on my iPhone. The same with paintings. I pulled up some Velasquez painting. And you can see it in your living room at actual size on your iPhone walk up close to it, walk away from it, all that stuff. So we live in an age where there's no excuses. Um, and I get a lot of inspiration from that. I love technology. My, my constant source of news and information is Wired Magazine. Uh, I find them very clever. I find their, in, their point of view on technology and the advances of that is really good. Um, so I read Wired cover to cover and I'm on their website every day. I, look to the New York Times and LA Times for news items and that kind of stuff, although the news is depressing. And I'm also really careful about what I put into my head. So I, I honestly can't watch the news a lot these days. Um, and I think a lot of us are in the same boat. So I'm, but I'm careful about that diet of information that I put in my head. Um, so I, that inspiration can come from a lot of different places. I'm not a big reader. I don't, I, uh, I, I just don't read. I, I read a lot of magazines. I read a lot of articles online. I don't read books cover to cover. I uh, don't read fiction. This may uh, reveal to you more boring things about Don than you ever want to know. But um, I, I just don't. I'm not interested in it. I just like fiction. This is just fiction. Somebody just made this up. This is no good. Um, but give me a good historical uh, good drama about the Civil War or tell me about William Morris and the arts and crafts movement uh, in England, I'm all over it. I will travel there to see it. I'm like, because it really happened and you can walk in his footsteps. 
Um, I just I just did a show for Disney about the Walt Disney Archives, and I got to spend an hour walking around the Disney Archives and talking about stuff. I love that because it's real. So different things light us up in different ways, and you and your listeners are all the same. Different things light us up, and you have to look for those things in your life. And it doesn't have to be what you do. You don't have to say, hey, I'm a uh, story artist, so all I can do is look at story reels and story artists and story sketch works. No, not at all. All the people I knew who I admired, the people that worked with Walt Disney and the people that built the animation business, they had big lives. They traveled. They, I think of Ken Anderson. Ken Anderson uh, or, or, or Mark Davis. Mark and Alex Davis would go to New Guinea when nobody went to New Guinea and they would buy masks and take pictures and do sketches and then come home and then they turn on the TV and Mark would sketch and and they would collect fabrics and they would buy the house next door because they had too much art and and they had lives I mean just real lives it almost didn't matter what they did although all of that inspiration came that they gathered came to their day job but they had big lives um, uh, outside of work and I think I see that as a fault in myself and many people I know in the industry, which is we get too focused. If you want to be a writer, you end up, gosh, I watched 50 movies this, this week and I watched, I binge watched all of, uh, you know, Perry Mason and I, you know, whatever it is, that's fine. But what else did you do? Did you go out and paint? Did you, um, I think of uh, uh, Tonko House, Dai Statsumi and Robert Kondo, um, who did The Dam Keeper a few years ago. When they were doing that short, which got an Academy Award nomination, they forced their staff to go out every morning and paint outside, paint trees, paint buildings, paint houses, paint the Starbucks. And they would go out and uh, paint from real life with real natural colors. Then they would come in and work. So you have to find those things in your life which are out of your box of comfort. That might be playing the harp. That might be uh, listening to music. That might be researching a historical thing or watching a documentary. Uh, or cooking or playing tennis. So whatever it is in your life that lights you up um, outside of your work is really as important as your work. Good balance, life balance in many ways. Um, yeah. uh, Matt, we've got a number of great questions. Anything you want to jump in with for Don? Yeah, there is a, a lot of questions. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of questions. Um, where to start? Uh, let's start from the beginning. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Kamal wants to know, when creating a story, how can you make the story consistent? Um, it's the process, Kamal, of discovery. It's a great question. Um, and not being too fearful of the process. Um, it, you can't tell a story uh, beautifully from the start. Uh, here's another thing Walt Disney used to do that I do all the time. Uh, he used to walk around the studio and go home to his wife and kids and tell the story of, let's say, Pinocchio. So he'd go into animator A and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing Pinocchio. Here's the story. Then he'd go to the lunchroom uh, person and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing Pinocchio. Here's the story. He'd go home at night and tell his wife that. Uh, and every time he told it, it would change a little bit depending on the reaction he got. And if the lunchroom person got a little bored about halfway through, he'd change that part. And I remember uh, Roy Disney, Roy Edward Disney, um, who was Roy, Roy O. Disney's son, said when he was young, he had the measles and he was in bed. And Walt Disney came upstairs and told him the story of Pinocchio. And when he saw the final movie, he was disappointed because the story that Walt told him sitting on his bed as a little boy was so great and so dramatic and so interesting that it couldn't live up to anything you could put on the screen. So I think getting a story, going back to Kamal's question, is the, the consistency is to uh, repeat, rinse and repeat. Uh, tell the story, tell it to each other, uh, tell it to your mom, tell it to your dog, invite your friends in, have them watch it. You don't have to take all their notes, you don't have to do everything they say is broken or whatever. But boy, we do that, we tested Lion King in front of an audience 11 times. And every time we made a change. So it's really about that. It's about iterating and, and, and listening and saying, where do people laugh? Where are our jokes not getting a laugh? Uh, where are our characters not? You know, like in Beauty and the Beast, the biggest trouble was the Beast was interesting. He was fascinating. He looked interesting. Belle was sort of vacuous. It's like, what's Belle's story? What does she want? She wasn't like mermaid. She didn't want legs or her man or something. Um, so we had to work really hard on getting Belle something 
that she wanted. And, and the idea of reading and wanting adventure was a real big part of her personality. So that's it. It's an iterative process and it's looking to, uh, to build. I'll use one more uh, ridiculous metaphor and then we can go on to the next question, which is it's like sculpting. So you start out with an armature and you say, okay, my movie's like this piece of wire. And then you put some big clumps of clay on it and you say, well, my movie's now like these big clumps of clay. And then you put some detail on it and then you rip off a part of it and stick on another clump of clay. And then you add some more detail and pretty soon your sculpture's done. So it's that process of building slowly from the armature on out that you're looking for in your storytelling. Good analogy. Matt, what's next? Uh, this is a question from one of our teens who says, uh, who's asking, what would you consider the most impart important part in pre-production when making an animated project, when it's for television or for feature film? Wow. Um, the, the, probably the most, it's a great question. Probably the most important part is making sure everyone's telling the same story. And by that, I mean, I've had movies where this, the, uh, I'll take Haunted Mansion for an example. Haunted Mansion, the studio wanted an Eddie Murphy comedy, and Rob, who's a great director, wanted to make it a little more scary and serious. And so there was a tonal disagreement between the studio and Rob. I've been on movies where there was disagreement about what the movie was on the crew of the movie. Some people saw it as a uh, romance. Some people saw it as a comedy. Some people saw it as a farce. Uh, an example of that is Emperor's New Groove. Um, it started out being very dramatic. And the more we cast David Spade and listened to him and Bertha Kitt, the more it became obvious it had to be funny. And there's a big heart in that movie, uh, but it's a comedy and it's irreverent. And, and the end result is because everybody started to see the same movie in their head, which wasn't the case at the beginning of that movie. Um, that's the hardest thing. You know, can you, and, and, and just because the script and the director say it's one thing, doesn't mean that everybody gets that. So the script might say, uh, this is a romance. The director might say, this is a romance. And the crew starts to pull away and say, no, it's an adventure movie. You know, yeah, there's a guy and a girl in it and yeah, they fall in love, but that's not what it's about. What's the movie about? What's the primary driver in the movie? It's not the romance, it's the adventure. So uh, you have to make sure everybody's telling the same story. And it goes back to that kind of team chemistry idea of uh, getting everybody to pull and do their rowing in the boat in the same direction. Point. Next question, Matt. Uh, this one's from Eugene. Uh, they're asking, what is something an aspiring animation producer should be doing daily? Uh, Sit-ups. Uh, I, uh, wow. You have to soul search. There's as many styles of producing as there are people on the planet. And I really mean that. There's no one way to approach it. So you have to look at yourself and say, what are your strengths and weaknesses? And we talked about that a little bit in the last hour. Um, and, and, and what do you love? What do you wake up in the morning and love? If it's storytelling, develop that skill, dig deep into it. Um, and, and, uh, and also you want to fill in areas that you don't know much about. Read some books about budget and schedule. Read some books about music. Read some books about post-production. Learn all the aspects of it. Uh, I'll go back to my orchestra conducting uh, thing because, um, you know, when you're a musician and a conductor um, of an orchestra, the conductor has to put out as much effort physically as the people playing. So it's a, it's a difficult physical business to play a fiddle or a trombone or a trumpet or a timpani. And the conductor has, the orchestra has to feel that you're putting out that energy, um, even though the conductor may not run out onto the orchestra and pick up an instrument and play. As a producer, the crew has to feel like you're interested, engaged, that you're showing up. Uh, that's a problem in live action a lot because a lot of live action producers have multiple projects. So sometimes you feel like, well, where's the producer? He hasn't been around for years and she, you know, she's been on vacation. You have to be engaged um, and you have to, the crew needs to feel and you need to feel like you're expending as much energy on the project as you can. You don't have to know everything about everything. Um, you have to hire great people to do those things. Uh, but you have to be curious enough to know a little bit about everything. Um, one of my favorite producers is Quincy Jones. 
And so I follow Quincy Jones. I see what he's doing. I look at his career. I look at his past albums. I see what he, what his philosophy is. Uh, he has a, a level of, of quality he's always going for, um, a, a level of uh, production he's going for, a way that he runs a recording session. Um, so look at people like that that you might admire and just say, you know, here's, here's some people in my life. Uh, like for me, it was Quincy Jones. It was Walt Disney. It was Jim Henson. Um, those are the people I look to and I studied them. I read their biographies. Steve Martin's another one. How did Steve Martin, yes, he's a comedian, but he's a craftsman. He writes and he, he worked his comedy act uh, in a very deliberate way before he went out on stage. So I read his biographies and just study how those people get their craft done um, and then learn from them. So I, I would do that. Don't worry too much about the details. If you're an animation producer, you'll, you'll learn about it. You'll learn about color. You'll learn about all those things. But um, go to your great producers and find out how they did it and then adapt it and just say, listen, I'm not going to do it the way Steve Martin did it or, or Jim Henson, uh, but I'm going to have my own style and know that that's okay, that you're absolutely okay. You don't have to produce like Don Hahn. Thank God you can produce like yourself and be incredibly successful. You've talked a little bit about uh, flexibility, but uh, has there ever been an instance when uh, you talk a bit about what you've learned about when to be flexible and when not to be flexible, when you've had to kind of get the st ship steered back <laughs> on the right course, not get too off on a, too far on a tangent. Um, uh, I'll use Roger Rabbit as an example. We had a great director uh, in Bob Zemeckis, who was the live action director and Richard Williams, who was the animation director. And um, Richard, was brilliant and his work is unbelievable. Um, but his method of working was maddening if you were a producer. Um, I, because he did a lot of research and a lot of uh, percolating on an idea. So if we came up to a deadline, he would uh, go out and have eggs on toast. And then as the deadline got closer, he would go out and play his trumpet. And then he would go to a bookstore. Um, and then two days before the deadline, he would have some more eggs and then he would finally stay up all night and finish. Um, Freddie Moore, the animator was like that. Uh, I didn't know him, but apparently he was. Other animators are methodical. I have five days for this scene. It's five feet long. I'll do a foot a day. Most artists are not that way. So a lot of it is, um, is trying to manage and understand the process and know when you're out of time and out of luck. We came to a day on Roger Rabbit where the math didn't work, where we said, this movie has to be in theaters this summer, and we only have 10 weeks left, and it means we have to do an amount of footage that has never been done before. But you know what? We can't go home until we do that footage every day. And we did. We just did it that way. It happened on Rescuers Down Under, which I didn't work on, but Kathleen Gavin, who's an amazing producer, uh, they were using the CAP system, the computer graphics system for the first time. And there came a day when it was like Bumblebee flight where they looked at the schedule and they looked at the computer and they said, this can't be done on paper. There's no way it can be done. And she just didn't tell anybody. She went out and said, this is what we're doing. Every week we have to do this. We're going to bring in food. We're going to arrange for childcare. We're going to pay you overtime. And we're not going home until this much is done this week. And it is amazing. I have never, ever been disappointed by that. It's a horrible uh, crunch at the end of the movie, but learning curves in animation are steep. It's a long, slow thing, and then all of a sudden panic sets in. I, I like those days, actually. I like the energy that that gives to the project, and the learning curve goes straight up. Um, sadly, there's elements of that, uh, like lighting or ink and paint in the old days, that would be uh, that would suffer under that because they were at the end of the pipeline. They never disappointed. We could sit down with Ink and Paint 30 years ago and say, you have to do 300 feet, a little over three minutes every week, and you've never done more than 200 before. And they would get it done. So, you know, we're amazing human beings. We're highly adaptable. And we're really good at doing things that we never thought we could do. Uh, and television schedules are worse than the feature schedule. So you just get to that day where you can um, mess around for a few years and go on field trips, have a coffee, take everybody to lunch, and then your team's together, your movie's as good as it's going to get, and you launch a, a, out of panic towards your release date because the theaters are booked 
and you're more likely to run out of time than you are out of money. Uh, the money will be there somehow by hook or by crook, uh, but time's your biggest enemy at that point. And then you also have to manage as a producer where you put your efforts. On all movies I've worked on, all of them, um, you start to drop things. We cut things out of Beauty and the Beast left and right. We cut scenes out. We took stripes off the beast. On uh, Punchback of Notre Dame, Frollo the villain's hat was really difficult to draw. So at the beginning of the fight at the end, Kathy Zelensky had his hat knocked off. So somebody kicks him, his hat flies off, and he, all of a sudden she doesn't have to draw the hat for five minutes. So you come up with solutions that the audience isn't going to care about that gets your movie done. Flexibility is key. Um, and, and has there ever been an, an instance, oh my gosh, uh, hard to believe, have you ever had to kind of step in and be the heavy, be the jerk about something to, to keep things on track, to really come down heavy on an artist or to press them? I know your style is very different. Um, that's an unusual thing for you. Has that ever happened? Yeah, yeah, uh, um, yeah, all the time. And, and it's usually at those moments when you run out of time. And I, you know, there's another side of me that is, I, I'm not a screamer, but I'm, um, I can be persuasive and I can be realistic. I, I'm really good at telling the truth to people and just saying, um, we're at this point in the production and you're not. So I need you to get up with everybody else or I need to replace you. And that motivates people, you know, to say, I, I better step up and get up with everybody else or I'm gonna lose my job. And that's a harsh reality, but it's something you have to do sometimes. I don't do that very very often for qualitative reasons, although that's happened. I've had instances where animators were miscast and the directors like come in and just say, hey, you know, Johnny or Susie isn't really cutting it. And you have to replace that person because they aren't artistically matching. Uh, but yeah, you do, you do have to be the heavy. Somebody needs to be the mom or dad. Um, you also have to manage the studio so that you're managing a crew of people that you work with every day on kind of a lateral plane, but there's also a studio of executives who are very nervous about if the movie's gonna succeed and they're pouring money into it, they're marketing it, and they're wondering if it's gonna get done, and there's a lot of anxiety there that you have to manage. And the best way to do that is to uh, be truthful there. I've, I've seen other producers, and I've done this too, where you try to create um, a positive image and say, you know, we're doing good, we're gonna make it, we'll be okay. And ultimately that doesn't work. It's much better to say, uh, we're not okay. We're gonna have to do things we have never done before, but here's how we're addressing it. The other thing I learned is there's never one thing that makes your movie move faster. So there's never one screaming match that makes everybody go faster. Um, so I, whenever that happens, I always look for 10 things. You just have to say, well, okay, what are 10 things? Well, Johnny and Susie have to do faster and we have to get a better piece of software here and we have to bring dinner in over here and childcare here and we have to uh, provide laundry services here or whatever it is. And those 10 things elevate the movie. Um, so it's really trying to strategize with your team. What do they need? Where are they suffering? Uh, we we have a, a, a huge earthquake during Lion King and nobody could get to work. It's not unlike a huge pandemic where nobody can get to work. And there's some really clever people out there right now in the industry saying, hey, with this kind of software, with Zoom, with, with this kind of uh, plug-in, we can have you work from home. And that's the service mentality that you need to get it done. So you just say, hey, this sucks. No, nobody likes a pandemic, but animation is uniquely postured to keep going. I mean, thank God we all work in animation. Um, and so everybody comes up with those solutions where you can keep going. And, and again, we're incredibly adaptable, incredibly clever human beings to be able to do almost anything. So with, I've seen earthquakes, I've seen floods. On Frank and Weenie, we were in uh, London and we found an unexploded ordinance in the Thames River out in front of the studio. Had to evacuate the studio until the bomb squad came in and took the bomb away and then everybody had to get back to work. So you, you roll with the punches, which is crazy, but it's life. We all roll with the punches in our personal and professional lives and that's what makes it fun. And now you can add pandemic to your plethora of, of uh, absolutely absolutely on disasters portfolio <laughs> i've had so many disasters in my life as you know <laughs> that may be another program where we talk about producing beyond disasters matt yeah. uh, other questions yeah we have another one from another one of our teams here um 
when someone pitches an animation idea to you for you to produce, what do you look for? Great question. Um, I, oh man, it's like falling in love. Um, those of you listeners who are old enough to maybe uh, have your own apartment or have bought a house or something like that, uh, any of you who have are in a relationship the first time you met that person, there's an intriguing element about that person. You may not know everything about that person, but you know enough to want to have lunch, and then you know enough to ha want to have dinner, and then you know enough to want to spend more time with that person and uh, you know, have a more serious relationship. And that's, to me, what a movie is. Um, so enough to be interested and want to go out to lunch with that movie would be my answer, <laughs> is to say, oh, I never thought of that. I never thought of, of uh, doing rats in a kitchen. Well, let's, let's think about that. Well, you could have, it's in Paris. Wow, Paris, that's a huge canvas. Uh, rats being counterintuitive, it could be a really interesting idea. It's like a fish out of water. Uh, rats in a kitchen, that could be interesting. What are the music possibilities? Um, so you start to fall in love with that. Uh, and, and at times you realize the relationship's not gonna work. I've had plenty of ideas where, plenty of ideas. So one of them is, uh, ended up being frozen, but we worked on Snow Queen for years. And Snow Queen was like, oh man, this, uh, we love it, but we don't know how. And, and um, we just tried and tried and tried and couldn't get it working. And thank God people came along and got it working and it became frozen. So um, it's that, it's that. Look for something you love. I go back to something I said a while ago, which is look for something that's personal, uh, something that touches you emotionally or as a, something that's funny in your own personal life and, um, and let that be your movie because you're more likely to, when times get tough, you're more likely to stick with it if you have a personal investment in it. Otherwise, it's just a job and life's too short for a lot of jobs in your life. We all have to do them, but look for the things in your life that you can really sign up to personally. Um, it's like buying that house. You walk in the door of a hundred houses and then they don't feel quite right. And then all of a sudden you walk into that apartment that has the best view and the coolest kitchen and it's, it's small, but that's better than you thought it would be. And you fall in love and you move in. Um, and so that's what you want to look for in your movie. Great question. Um, and Matt, what's next? Uh, we have a question that wants to know, how do you balance your desire to contribute as much as possible to make the best project and your commitment to your personal life, like family? Wow, that's probably uh, one of the best questions of the day. Uh, it's very hard. It's very hard and there's a lot of dangers and pitfalls um, because the personal family and support system at home uh, and your own personal time, your downtime where you're alone is, uh, uh, as important as your job and it's too easy to give up it's too easy to give up uh your personal time and i do all the time i i started 25 30 years ago painting i don't golf i'm not big into sports i don't go to the gym all that stuff but i could go out with my um my box and do some plein air painting didn't matter what i painted didn't matter if the painting was good or bad but it was out in the fresh air and it was time when i could do nothing but think about it how damn hard it is to put two colors next to each other. So that was my release and still is. Um, uh, and so I, I really uh, you know, suggest that you find those moments of something that's totally different from what you do. It might be dancing, uh, it might be cooking, it might be travel, which I highly suggest, and use those moments to rejuvenate yourself. Uh, Walt Stanchfield, who was my mentor and Tina's mentor and a lot of us, um, used to say um, impression without expression equals depression, meaning we have so many impressions in our life and so many people trying to get our attention and advertising to us and having us read their blog and all that stuff. It's overwhelming. So we have to turn around and express ourselves. Otherwise, we're going to start to crumble. So finding those ways to express yourself outside the work area, there's some expression to be done at work, but that's a slightly different thing. How do you want to express yourself? Um, do you want to write? Do you want to cook? Do you want to paint? Uh, do you love exercise? Do you love sports? Do you know, what is that thing that gets you totally out of your head um, and into another space? Um, and relationships are the same thing, is trying to pay attention to your primary relationships, and that might be a parent or a, a spouse or a, a boyfriend, girlfriend, or a child. Um, those are the easiest things to give up. 
um, because you love them and they love you. And it's easy to say, hey, I have to work late tonight for the next three months. And they're the ones sometimes that suffer. So we all have to do that from time to time, but it's trying to find those times when you can uh, stay connected with them and say, well, let's carve out this moment to have dinner together as a family. Let's carve out this moment together to take a road trip or whatever and, um, and not throw those things away. And this gets back to the old guys that founded animation. They, they just had lives and they were, they, they worked six days a week back then. So on Snow White, they were working Monday through Saturday. On Sunday, they were building steam locomotives in their backyard and they were painting and they were uh, flying uh, gliders out at Lancaster. And, you know, so what's that thing that you can do on the weekend that is ridiculous? You're playing Dixieland jazz, you're like, whatever. Um, that is totally different from what you're doing and uh, kind of gets you out of your head for a while and, and you can relax and center yourself and get back to your work again. A key part of that balance. Um, is that often times too, you'll see parallels or inspiration in the doing of that? To what? To yeah. Focuses? yeah. No, that's a really good point. You, you Nothing exists in isolation. So uh, a book, a painting, a, uh, a road trip that you take uh, always brings ideas back to your day job. There's always, man, I, I wish I had a list of uh, like story people that would come in on Monday morning and say, Hey, you know, last weekend I went out to Death Valley and I saw this thing and I wondered if that could fit in this sequence or, you know, I saw this movie or I had lunch with a friend who was just in from uh, Guatemala and he said, you know, so yeah, those, those extracurricular things are not unimportant. They're really important because you want to fill up your bucket with stuff so that when you come to work, you have things to contribute. And uh, there are seasons when you have to work seven days a week. But if you have time off or if you're, uh, you know, if you're out of work or whatever, uh, you know, don't get too sad. Go out there and go, wow, what a great opportunity. I can go out and read some books and travel and try some Vietnamese food and, you know, whatever it is you want to do and kind of refresh yourself with that kind of stuff. And that's crucial, really. And, and do some things that are uncomfortable, you know. Do the, the, the greatest thing, uh, gosh, years ago was taking an improv class. If you want to be a story artist, sign up today for an improv class and just do it and go take an improv class and, and it's really uncomfortable and you'll be great for it. In fact, and I'm, I'm absolutely honest, every great story person I know from uh, Disney and other studios have been through some sort of groundlings or improv class because it, it gets, gets you out of your head, out of your ego and into just telling stories. So stuff like that is brilliant. So you would recommend, have you ever, purposefully place yourself in an uncomfortable context to sort of <laughs> yes what's yeah i mean I, I hesitate just like you do and everybody does of doing something that's uncomfortable yeah. but yes I, I guess my my place for uncomfortability is uh, travel um so i'm i'm i love travel and i have no problem like last october i love the arts and crafts movement and last October, I went to um, the Lake Districts in England and, and toured uh, every historic person's house that I possibly could. So I went to Beatrice Potter's farm and saw where she did her mouse drawings and William Morris's house in Kelmscott and you know, just went around. I had no hotel reservations. I rented a car. I found a place to stay. I packed light. Um, I, I ate interesting food at places I didn't make reservations for and that kind of uh, following your nose and it's, it's not really uncomfortable. It's kind of uh, Rick Steves uncomfortable. So it's, it's like getting out there and experiencing life through travel, which may be a little slow these days, but eventually it'll open up and, and allow yourself into experiences. I love, I love, you know, going to Japan or places that are really different and just going for a walk, go for a walk, find out stuff or order something ridiculous in a restaurant um, and just see what happens. And you'll be fine, but you'll bring some new things to your life. And, and it goes back to that idea of energy. How can you be energetic at work or in your family life if you yourself don't have energy? And that energy for me anyway, comes from experiences like that where I can go out and say, wow, there's a world out here that I've never experienced before and it lights me up, it gets me excited. Um, so for me last October, 
it was uh, it was the arts and crafts movement. Mm, great way to recharge. Um, you've told the story of, and, I, and Glenn has told the story of uh, trying to, and I think as a as a creative producer, you have a sensitivity for this, uh, for the sequence, the transition sequence in Beast. Um, how he was transforming, Glenn was having a challenge with that and he couldn't quite get to it. And so you, you gave him the opportunity, even though you were up against a very harsh deadline, he, you both, to just step away. Uh, and he found himself wandering over to uh, uh, the Norton Simon Museum and found inspiration there. Um, yeah. Just finding a way to change it up. So as a producer, are you keeping an eye on um, it's sort of the care and feeding of your talent um, that you bring on board and helping them. You talked about uh, servicing them, but also sometimes stepping in and saying, wait a minute, step away. You need to take a break. You'll, you'll get the answers. What kinds of, of things give you the heads up on that? Where are you? Uh, it's it, a lot of it's just intuition um, and, and the person any of us uh, on this call today would trust Glenn Keane to finish on time. I mean, you really would, um, but finish what on time? And it's funny thing about animation, the hardest part is not animating. The hardest part is not drawing. The hardest part is not moving a rig around. The hardest part is the thinking and coming up with what that's gonna be and how you're gonna express an emotion. And sometimes that's through the lack of movement or a single strong pose or whatever. Sometimes that's through a color or through a piece of music. Um, a lot of story artists I know, like Chris Sanders, listened to music constantly when he was storyboarding and music was his primary motivation. Um, so yeah, Glenn, Glenn was stuck and it made sense for me and anyone just to say, well, how do you want to get unstuck? And, he, and, uh, and I love Glenn. I just think he's so brilliant, um, but he is like the rest of us and he, went up then to the museum, to the Norton Simon. If you've been there, out in front of the museum is the uh, Burgers of Calais, is the sculpture. And it's a wonderful sculpture. And Rodin sculptures are incredibly expressive anyway. And he spent the day drawing those. Uh, it's it's a, like the Tonko House guy spending the day out painting from nature. So how are you gonna get something that you can go back to your desk with some strong point of view on what you're gonna do? So the doing is a part of it, but the bigger part is what are you gonna do? Um, and that was, Glenn didn't have the, what am I gonna do? He could draw anything, he could draw anything. So being able to get away for a, a day or two and figure out what it was he wanted to do and get some inspiration uh, was the key for him. Uh, other people may not be like that, but most people are. You know, For most people, you can just say, hey, get out of here and, uh, and go paint or go to an art museum or go to a bookstore and that'll be enough to uh, get them back on track again. How frequently does that tend to happen at, on a production or, or as you're take, building things? I mean, are you finding instances um, where a writer might be stuck on a, a story element? So is it bringing in story artists who come up with ideas or letting them go off and figure out what they might need yeah, I mean, sometimes it's refreshing the gene pool, as it were. You know, it's saying a, like a, a story department is like a pool of water and you need refreshment coming into it, otherwise it'll go stagnant, that kind of thing. So sometimes it's bringing in a new story artist um, or getting some notes from an outside person. There's a, a great thing that uh, Disney used to do and, and, and they do at most studios now, which is kind of a brain trust idea, so that a certain group of people is the brain trust. They might be directors or whoever. Um, come in on every movie and give notes. So you have this kind of uh, supreme court of creative talent come in and give brutal notes, really honest notes, uh, and then they go away. And then whether you do them or not, you know, like audience screenings, whether you do the audience's notes or not is up to you as a filmmaker. Uh, but getting those notes is enough of a kick in the pants to get you going again. So the brain trust is a way of doing it um, artistically if you're a colorist or a painter same thing if you're a character designer um you know so many character designers do work that is very similar to other character designers and you start to look at character designs and you go well this looks like everybody else's character designs um and so there you have to get out and say well i'm going to look at um other 
mediums and try to find caricatures there. I'm, I found a photography site, for example, where uh, this photographer went to rodeos in the South and photographed people candidly without them knowing it. And he got all kinds of great kind of, you know, here's a guy with tattoos and a wife beater t-shirt and here's a woman who's had too many churros. And, and that was so inspiring for character design. Um, sometimes it's bringing in uh, an outside designer like Gerald Scarf or Mike Mignola or whatever to help design your characters. Um, so the idea that you're going to sit there and come out with the greatest character designs of all time, now you're probably going to go back to your, your 10 greatest tricks. You know, here's my, here's my expression number one, here's my expression number two, here's happy, here's sad, here's a bunch of different costumes. That's not character design. Character design is, uh, comes from the story, what that character is, what that character needs, what that character wears, where that character exists in an environment, that's character design. Um, and so, so, you know, go out and look at, uh, newspaper caricatures and 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 old uh, publications like Punch magazine from or Simplicissimus, the German magazine from a hundred years ago. Look at Heinrich Clay, um, you know, and get some uh, inspiration from the real world is a is a better solution for that. And most importantly, on any job on any movie, is look at the story. You know, you shouldn't be designing in a vacuum. What is the story? What does this character have to go through? It's not just about happy or sad. What does this character go through? What is the environment this character lives in? Uh, and how can the environment uh, reflect the character as much as the character him or herself? You can walk into a room, Roger and Anita's flat in London in 101 Dalmatians. You don't need those characters in that room to know who they are. There's books everywhere. There's a piano. There's a dog bed. You kind of know who they are. You can walk into my house or your house and you know who you are. You know, I wish I could walk into all of your uh, apartments right now because I could tell you a little bit about yourself if I just looked at like, oh, the, your, your sink is absolutely clean and you cleaned up after dinner last night and, and you didn't. And oh, your laundry stacked up. And I, I, that will tell me as much about you as, as your character. So that kind of thing and the being able to uh, um, kind of understand the environment and how that affects us and how the story affects us is, in, is as important to character design as anything. Uh, great, great answer. You're stepping ahead of all my questions about environments and worlds and characterizations. That's great. Matt, uh, we've got a couple more questions. Yeah, we got one more question here that uh, they're asking, how can a producer be open to making changes in production when they're working closely with an executive of a film studio? Another great question. Really good, you guys. Thank you. The um, it, Most executives want one thing. They want what you want. They want your movie to be good. Nobody starts out and says, I want to make a mediocre movie. Or uh, nobody starts out saying, hey, I want to make a really good schedule. Uh, everybody wants to make a good movie. So they want what you want. And um, I think the one mistake that I've made that, that some producers do is to dismiss the executives or ignore them and maybe not bring them into the process as much as you should. And it's, it's this thing we all have as artists. We like to do work and not show other people. Um, so you have to kind of pace it out, but the more, the, the more you can bring somebody into the process and say, Hey, every Tuesday, come on by for a half hour and we'll show you what we're doing and just open up and let that process happen. Then there's no surprises. The, the biggest crashes I've had in my career is when we've gone, uh, three months without showing an executive something, suddenly the executive walks in and says, what, this isn't what, this isn't the story I thought we were telling. What's this? So that progressive ownership of bringing an investor or, you know, let's say you're a small studio making a independent feature. Um, your investors aren't just about money. They may know nothing about movies, but they want to be part of it. And so building some ownership, having them look in once in a while is uh, a good way of building that ownership. Um, and, and then, um, you know, getting them invested in the story. Again, the story drives everything, even the investment. So yes, they'll be interested in your budget and your schedule and advertising and marketing, uh, but they're interested in the story because if the story isn't there and the movie isn't there, they have nothing to sell and they have no uh, box office and they have no bonus at the end of the year or whatever. So it's about the story and the movie being successful uh, and being willing to share along the way. If you're going to get bad news, get it in little parcels along the way and let that executive contribute and build ownership in your movie. Uh, it has been the most successful for me. Hard to do. It's really hard to do because 
you want to hide it until it's perfect. And you want to just say, you know, listen, we're on it. We think it's going great. We'll see you in a year and you're going to love it. That doesn't work. Uh, it's better just to share it along the way. Have you ever had any um, challenges with executives where um, their opinions may have been way off in left field? Or how, how would you manage something like that? Yeah, I'll give you... Uh, um, one executive, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who, if he were listening in, I'd be happy to say the same thing. His notes were always good about what was broken. His way of fixing it was always horrible. So he would go, this sequence isn't working. I'm not getting any chemistry between these two characters. What if we put a Bee Gees song into this moment? And so he would leave and we would go, Okay, he was really right about it. That isn't firing off. Let's fix that. We don't need to put a BG song here. And he would be fine with that. It's like, fix it. I can tell you what's broken. Fix it. I, I don't care how to fix it. Uh, the tough part is if the executive comes in and has the solution and wants to see their solution. That's really hard because like, like any human being, sometimes those solutions will be good. Sometimes they'll be bad. Um, so you just lean into it and just say, listen, we listened to your solution. We love the Bee Gees, but once we tried it, it felt anachronistic and it popped us out of the movie. And what we wanted to do is stay in the movie. So we decided not to do a song there and just re you know, rewrite the scene. Um, so explain why you're doing it and just instead of just saying, we didn't address your note. Um, so you really have to treat executives like human beings. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but uh, build some ownership with them. They may not be tremendously gifted uh, with notes, although I've worked with some executives who are really gifted with notes, really good. Uh, Roy Disney would be one. Roy was a writer. Roy, you might think, oh, he's about financing and banking and stuff, sailing, whatever. Uh, Roy never said much in the room, but he was a writer. So he would go home that night and he would write an email and he'd send you the email the next morning. And it was full of really interesting, insightful, thoughtful notes that you could take a lot of them and use them. So it's really judging on that, using your executives as though they're another member of the team. Um, they're not necessarily your story boss. You don't have to follow them. You, and, and I think studios get into trouble when that happens, to be honest. Um, there's been many times when the ego of the studio head starts to uh, get in the way and that studio head starts to think their ideas are fantastic. Uh, but I don't think Walt Disney even did that. Walt Disney listened Yes, he would tell you what he thought. Yes, he had a contribution to make, uh, but he surrounded himself with great people. And so did Jim Henson and so did Quincy Jones and all these great producers. And that's what you want to look for is treat your executives fairly, include them in the process. But you don't have to listen to their solutions. Listen to their problems. The, their problems are almost always right. And ego, uh, there really isn't, a, you know, you want to save the drama for the screen and not in the room, but as you mentioned before, but... Uh, there are egos. There are a lot of egos. How that's a lot to juggle. You're you're masterful at, at handling um, a range of egos. What what tips do you have <laughs> in that arena? Um, I, I always say producers are part uh, you know cheerleader, part psychotherapist. You, I do a lot of listening. A lot of times, egos. Uh, you know, first of all, egos come with the arts, and thank God it does. You want that. Um, and I, I've worked with uh, Howard Ashman and Alan Menken and, and Elton John and Sting and everybody. And they all have egos. But uh, a lot of times it's just them uh, either venting or expressing themselves. And then in the act of expressing themselves and telling you what they want or think, they're smart people and they'll listen to themselves and they'll be able to put that thought in the air and the two of you can discuss it then. So a lot of times it's just shutting up as a producer. Just say, I'm going to shut up. Come in and sit down in my chair. Talk to me for a half hour. And then we'll talk about what we just heard. <clears throat> and talk about what your concern is. And go back to work. And that relieves the pressure a little bit. You want ego, though. You're not trying to take it away. Most people know that when they walk into an animation studio that it's a team sport. It, I mean, it's, it's baseball, it's basketball, it's football, it's soccer. It's a team sport. So you can be a ball hog and try to, you know, score every goal yourself. 
But the reason that uh, Kobe and, and, you know, LeBron are great players is that they pass the ball. They have not only the highest shooting averages, but the highest assists of passing the ball to other people to shoot. Um, and I think people understand that. Uh, they really do. And, 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 you know, whether you're Elton John or anybody else, they get that. And they, they really do. Uh, and the bigger the talent, I find often they are big talents because they get that. They understand that they don't have all the solutions. Um, so that's it. It's, it's trying to get the, the team spirit out there when there are bumps or people who flame out um, listening um, and trying to understand what's, what's bothering you, what's really bothering you. Are your feelings hurt? Uh, why? And a lot of times there's good reasons and you want to listen to those and react to them and be responsible as a manager to those uh, feelings that people are having. Uh, and that's part of the job. So, uh, Matt, I just want to check, do we have any other questions on the, on the chat? Uh, we have just a few more. Okay. Uh, this is, one this reminds me of the, uh, this, this is kind of like the Labor Day telethon. Yes. If we were raising money right now for multiple sclerosis, it would be fantastic. <laughs> let's check the board, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ed, let's check the board. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Oh, that's fine. Um, it, someone was asking in pre-production and animation, I know there are so many elements happening at once. What is the best way to keep everyone on, on your team on the same page, especially now with some people working remotely? Yeah, remote work is, is tough. I, I don't think it's impossible. But if you're in the same studio, you can say, hey, let's all get together on Wednesday and, <clears throat> and show everything. And we did that a lot in pre-production on a movie like Atlantis or, or even Haunted Mansion or whatever. We would fill a room with stuff and then bring everybody in and just say, okay, art direction, you go first. Well, here's the set design for this. Here's what we want to do with that. Costuming, you're on. Okay, costumes, we would like to do this, we'd like to do that. And, and share. And those aren't necessarily to solicit comment, but they're solicit, to solicit ownership. And uh, a lot of times your time with the director is very limited. The directors have huge schedules, but those sharing times are really important. Really hard to do on Zoom, but it can be done. So to be able to set up a Zoom meeting, have everybody go through their work and screen share and just say, okay, you know, I've been doing character designs for a while. Here's some color work. Here's some visual development. Here's some color scripts I've been working on and let everybody do a show and tell. And just, you know, you don't have to have a lot of discussion that it's not for even for approvals, you know, in pre-production, you don't want a lot of approvals. You just want to say, uh, okay, guys, go out there with a blank piece of paper and fill the room with cool stuff. Look at Mary Blair's work. Her, her work is outstanding because uh, she had no limits on what she could do. And so she was good at filling a room. So was Mel Shaw. So was anybody. In, you know, name your favorite visual development artist. Um, they fill the room with inspirational material. Um, and then I, I would, as a producer, send that material to Hans Zimmer or Alan Menken or Howard Ashman and just say, hey, I know you have the script, but here's 10 paintings that really excite me and send that visual development to them. And um, that also inspires people. Not, words don't inspire everybody all the time. So sharing things as a producer, sending stuff around, um, you know, just saying, here's, here's a song that Howard Nallen just wrote. I'm going to send that to the art department. You know, or I, or I, would, I would have the character merchandising people come over who are building toys for a movie. Come on over and see what we're doing so you can get excited the way we're excited. So a lot of times it's doing that. It's just saying, here's, here's 10 things that excite me about this movie come on over, um, have some chips and salsa, and we're gonna share those things. And the energy that we feel, uh, we hope that you feel too. And I do a lot of that, I, I love that. Because part of being a producer is to manage the event of the movie and it coming out and the marketing and the release of it. And the biggest part of that is to sell the sellers. You know, people that you're gonna go out and sell your movie and they have to be really excited because they're busy and overworked and they have to feel like your movie is something special. And that's uh, getting them as excited as you are about your own movie. Great question. And you said there were a couple more, Matt? Yeah, I know we're running light on time, or tight on time here. Um, so how about, uh, this person says they know you curate exhibits with the Walt Disney Museum. As a producer, how is the production of that different from producing a film? Oh, wow, great question. Thank you for asking that. I do, I, I've curated a couple of shows at the Walt Disney Museum, I'm, I'm on their advisory board and I love them. You know, I, I love them because they 
<clears throat> tell a story. Um, so I would argue it's essentially curating a show of material about an artist or about the night old man or whatever it is, uh, is exactly like making a movie. You're telling a story. And so the fir literally, the f whether it's me or anybody else, the first thing you do is write a narrative. You say, what's the show about? What's the narrative? So here's a show about uh, the Impressionist painters or the night old men or whatever. Well, the, the show is they were once outcasts and then um, they were shunned from the uh, Paris Academy and then they became fashionable because of their technique and then they were branded as the Impressionists, which was a derogatory term. And then, you know, so you tell your story and you write a, a two or three page script about what that story is. And then you back up and, and um, this is very much like writing a book too, by the way. Then you back up and say, how can I illustrate that story? How can I show you some photographs and paintings and things that illustrate what that story is gonna be? And then how do I create a path of action through the, the museum physically that tells that story? So you want people to enter through this door and leave through that door. How do you create, this is exactly like making a movie. How do you create variety? You know, here's, here's 10 pieces of art, I'm a little bored. Oh, there's a video screen. That's interesting. Well, here's three more paintings. Oh, there's a drawing. Look, there's a steam train. Here's 10 more drawings. So the variety is important. Um, and there's technical aspects like spacing and color and lighting that are important. But the, the main thing, always, 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 is what story are you telling? And to answer the question, um, and I do this on every project, and if you learn anything from today, you need to learn on every project you're doing is, what's this about and why do I care? If you can answer those questions authentically, you're a long ways ahead. So what's this museum show about? Why do I care? Why do I want to see it? Why do I want to pay money, get out of my bed, get in dressed and then in the car and go see this show? Well, because it'll change your outlook on what a painter is or whatever. So those questions, whether it's a museum show or a book or a movie are really important. The why do I care is really tough because the world is full of so much noise have to go you you it you don't have to care because it's somebody important some of my favorite films are about people you've never heard of before but you have to care because you relate to those characters and the, those people in the, that movie make you feel uh emotions about them you're trying to solicit a, a the, the kind of physiology of it is you're trying to solicit a physical reaction to what you put on the screen or on the wall or in your book and that physical reaction might be laughter uh, it might be fear where your blood pressure goes up and your heart starts to beat faster. Uh, it, it might be a tear and, and heartache. And those are physical. Those are your body changing and expressing itself. And those kinds of physical emotions are memorable. Um, our greatest memories in life, if you, if you read about memory, it's not just events. It's events paired with emotion. The day you got married, the day your child was christened, the day you uh, failed out of your job, whatever it was. Um, so you don't remember what you had yesterday because there's no emotion linked with it. But if you ate yesterday with Queen Elizabeth and had a bad tuna melt, that has emotion and, and you'll remember that the rest of your life. So how can you create movies and, and build things that have interesting events that are all linked to great physical emotions and uh, that's what you have to search for every day no easy thing well uh as we are winding down i want to thank you don for your brilliance as always for spending time here sharing that and helping us to uh, get a better understanding into your world as a, a creative producer and and the importance of pre-production and rest assured if your schedule and time permits, um, we will have you back for many more discussions because clearly we can go off on a million tangents. <laughs> yes, we can. Well, I, I have to say back at you, Mindy, because what um, I really appreciate your, your questions and your preparation for these things. But on a bigger note, what you're doing at CTN and these um, series are really important. And what an opportunity to be a, a student, whether you're starting out and you're a teen or you're uh, deep into your career, to be able to listen to some of the people you've programmed on this segment and uh, to have the support of people like Tina uh, is really important. So thanks back to you and to Tina and to CTN for allowing me to come on and, uh, and yak for a couple of hours. We are grateful and uh, we look forward to having you back. 
So until then, thank you, and thanks to all those who attended. Go out and share the fun. We have some great uh, personnel lined up next week. Uh, Sergio Pablos, uh, we have Bonnie Arnold on the slate, and Lorna Cook, all talent that I know you're very uh, familiar with. <laughs> they're great. Oh, my God. I'll be listening. Great. Yeah, it's a terrific lineup. I'm, I'm a grateful kid in a wonderful sandbox of amazing talent. And I'm grateful to Pertina and her amazing team, Matt and Alicia and, and everybody involved to make this happen. So thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Spread the word. We'll be back next Tuesday. Be sure to check at ctntickets.com for more updates. And until then, thanks, Don, for being one of our great primary sources. You bet. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe and have a good day.